If you're curious if people are freeze drying in other countries besides the United States where it seems to be taking off in freeze dried candy, well, you're in for a special treat because I just interviewed a freeze dried business entrepreneur in the country of Panama. He has a YouTube channel and a freeze drying business called Two Guys in a Cooler. He's an excellent chef and he's been doing it for a long time making frozen meals and now with the advancement in technology in home freeze drying, he's purchased himself several freeze dryers over the past year and he's seeing a lot of success freeze drying his frozen meals, fruits, and pet food that you're really gonna to wanna to pay attention to in this interview. This full interview is fairly lengthy, so I've included a couple of timestamps of different topics that we covered down in the video description below. And if you're interested in becoming an entrepreneur yourself, go ahead and check out the whole playlist of all different interviews that I've done featuring freeze drying entrepreneurs as well as other manufacturers and equipment in the freeze drying space. Let's get to the interview and I'll introduce you to Eric at Two Guys and a Cooler. I'm talking with Eric who's located in a different country than the United States for most of the entrepreneurs I've been talking to and he's now venturing into the freeze drying side of his business which is very exciting that's why we want to talk to him. Eric Welcome to the Freeze Drying Business channel and our podcast series. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your business and uh, why you're getting into the freeze drying space? Well, first of all, hey, David, I've been a fan for quite some time. Thanks for having me on your show. Super excited about that. And, and yeah, we do live in Latin America and we've been here for about 15 years. And, you know, it's kind of strange how we got into the freeze dried business because it kind of segued to our, our natural business. We started a freezer meal business uh, about 15 years ago and uh, we would you know we kind of found like this niche in the market where people wanted food from back home but uh but they couldn't really get it because the ingredients are difficult to find and so on and so forth and so yeah we started a small family freezer meal business and uh, we from that business basically we were able to kind of like add on uh, certain elements to it right whether it's whether it's dog treats or whether it's, you know, soap making or, or whatever it was. It, it kind of gave us an avenue to be creative under this sort of cottage industry uh, license that we have here in this country. And about a year ago, maybe a little bit longer than a year ago, about two years ago, people started asking about freeze-dried food, right? And uh, it, it's, a, it's a bizarre experience to uh, go into a, a market where there's not really any competition, probably because freeze dryers aren't very cheap. And um, here in Panama, it's just not a common business. And so we started exploring the idea of, of adding, you know, high valued freeze dried meals, basically the meals that we were already making in the freezer meal version. And because we make them in such large quantities, we right. thought, you know what, it might be a good idea to just kind of kind of take a portion of those meals and set them to the side and freeze dry them, and then offer those same meals that people are already familiar with. They love them, they know the flavor and, and things like that. It's, it's not like it's new to them. And offer them in, in long-term storage you know, presentations, uh, whether it's for one person or two people or things like that. And that was kind of the beginning of it. So we started to kind of play around with you know, what the market looked like and uh, how can we make something like that happen. We uh, originally uh, reached out to Harvest Ride and, and Harvest Ride got us squared up with the right size unit for the size uh, business that we had at that time. It was a large model. And, you know, it's as you probably are well aware, you know, it, it can quickly escalate and, and it can quickly get to a place where you go, wow, we've kind of outgrown one large unit and maybe we need now two or three large units. And so what started as an endeavor into freeze drying dinners that we already had available for our customers, um, people started asking about desserts and treats and candies and, and things like that. And you got to remember, this is a novel thing for this country. This It's not something that's, you know, you, if, if someone in this country Googles that, then um, they're being taken to stores in America, right? It just doesn't exist in this country. Or if it does, it's it's not very well known. And so we realized very quickly that we had something special and, and we probably don't have it special for very long because eventually, you know, more people are going to see the opportunity and they're going to try to capitalize on it, which I don't blame them. It's a great opportunity. And so, you know, we went from meals to candies uh, and the candies has been an interesting experience. We could talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, and then we started to do uh, dog treats. We have two Italian Mastiffs. We feed them uh, a raw diet. 
And we thought, hey, let's freeze dry certain elements of their food so that we could give them as snacks. And as soon as people started hearing we were doing freeze dried chicken mix and liver and and uh, chicken bites and all kinds of organ meat and things like that, it completely went berserk. And now people started asking more about uh, buying uh, freeze dried dog treats, which uh, presented a completely different opportunity. And so we didn't think it was going to be nearly as as um, I don't know as well accepted, I guess, as, as it was, because, you know, there's a lot of unknowns when you kind of go down that road. How do I price it? How do I source the, the materials necessary in order to, to do it right? Like you don't want to come at it, you know, 50%, you want to come at it a hundred percent. And, um, and yeah, although, you know, sourcing all the materials has been challenging. The, the people here have been absolutely extraordinarily uh, like wide open arms with the products and it's just been great. But I also think that, you know, we, we price it fair, which I think is critical in a, in a good business. And, cool. um, and the product is good. So two guys in a cooler, is that yeah. your business or is that just the name of your YouTube channel? Okay. So yeah, when we got here about 15 years ago, I'm about to tell you, this is like breaking news kind of stuff. My audience doesn't even know what I'm about to tell you. I haven't, I haven't technically done a two guys in a cooler reveal party as to how how we origined our name because it, it doesn't necessarily make sense with the content that's on our youtube channel so when we came here 15 years ago we would attend local markets and we would bring some of the different things that we had whether it was organic lettuce or you know different freezer meals at that time we were making deep dish chicago pizzas and, and whatnot and there was a situation where uh, a woman who uh, th there was like a big fundraiser that happened at that time once a year. And and she would come around to all the bit, the vendors and ask for donations. And we gave her a donation and she said, hey, your name will, 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 will appear in this publication. What's the name of your business? And and honestly, it kind of took us by surprise. We didn't, because we were just, well, honestly, we were just two guys with an ice chest that had the things that we were selling in it. And, and it was freezer meals and and we had bagels and things like that. And so we told the lady, we said, you know, uh, we don't have a business name. It's we're literally just two guys in a cooler. And she said, great, I'll, I'll, I'll jot that down as your business. And the local community uh, uh, sort of found it super catchy. And, and they, they sort of, that's how they recognized it. So at that time, it was me and my, my son, who's 25 years old now. At that time, he was, you know, 11 or 12 years old a long time ago. And, um, and, and people started to Noah says the two guys in a cooler who had the food that would come to the market. Uh, the YouTube channel was started later. The YouTube channel, it's only been around for about five or six years. And that was kind of a way for me to creatively um, channel my obsessive compulsiveness, <laughs> you know, experiment with food and experiment with charcuterie and experiment with the different things that we do that don't necessarily make it to market, so to speak. And so we started to funnel all of those videos uh, and the the library of uh, videos on our channel is just a collection of basically everything that we're into. And so at any given moment, it could change. Uh, right now, we're doing a lot of freeze drying. But, you know, tomorrow we may be making cotton candy. Like, it's who knows? Yeah. Have you <laughs> so found, that's, that's kind of how it started. Have you found that YouTube has helped actually grow your sales for just your business in general and your brand and things like that? Or is it more of just a hobby that you enjoy, you know, video capturing what you're doing in your life and it's a fun fun thing to do that's a tricky question because as the channel gets bigger and it reaches a bigger audience um the international audience doesn't really know the nature of my local business and and so sure it, it's kind of crazy but you know every week someone from south africa is trying to get you know a meal or or, or a bag of dog treats or, or some sort of freeze dried candy because they hear about it and they, they contact me through through the channels that they find me in um, but locally, strangely enough, the, the local town knows me as the freezer meal guy. They Most people here don't even realize that I have a YouTube channel. And so uh, we're, we're more locally known as the family that feeds a community. But internationally known, uh, it, it's, it's quite the opposite. And so although there has been some cross, crossover, um, it, you know, for the most part, it, 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 I guess it's not very relevant because uh, what we do here is, is very isolated to a small community. <laughs> Tell us about what's going on in Panama, or at least in your little local town where you're this freeze dryer guy now. 
I know there's several other people that own freeze dryers. Uh, some have recently bought freeze dryers because of, of what we do. And they've, they've been inspired to, to start freeze drying either their own. There's a lot of farms where we live and there's a lot of dairy and there's a lot of fruit production. And so local, local people have said, Hey, that's a great way to preserve our, our, our harvest. And, and so, you know, people are doing it independently now, whereas they, they might not have been doing it before. People who had freeze dryers uh, before me, uh, used it they, it, they were very tiny and they used it for like personal personal use only. And so for, for us coming to market with the product, um, it's a it's a first. Nobody nobody's really kind of gone down that road. And and you know, we hit a lot of different markets with the freeze dryer. So it's not just like long term food storage, but we also do pet, we also do a, a candy. Another interesting thing is that the more people know we have a freeze dryer, especially businesses, the more they reach out to us asking whether or not we could provide our freeze dryer as kind of like a, a service, right? Hey, right. we'll, we'll rent out our freeze dryer to freeze dry their product or, or, or we'll charge them for the service of freeze drying their already made product, which is a kind of like an unexpected business opportunity, actually. Uh, the, the local, the local ice cream shop. Uh, wanted to have a different presentation of his ice cream, which is really good. And and he wanted to have a freeze dried version. Same thing with the different fruit places. And so it's it has it has really kind of exploded in the sense that um it's so new people are are kind of gravitating to it as kind of a, a cool way to introduce their existing product in a new way. And being that we're one of the only ones that have kind of said, hey, we're doing this thing commercially. Uh they're reaching out to us, which is kind of like flooding. It's almost I hate to say this, but it's almost like overwhelming. Like it's too much. We have to, yeah. we have to say, okay, we're not in a position right now to handle that kind of capacity, you know? So we try to turn other people onto buying their own free charter. Yeah, you know, I think that's, them out. I think that's common across the board for people who are running a freeze drying business. You have like one, two, maybe three, then you're commercial uh, where you maybe have several. And you've got a lot of different people asking you, one, you're trying to keep up with your own wholesale partners or just direct to consumer events. And then you have people that are asking you to, to uh, do your wholesale in bulk product so that they can repackage it and uh, that type of thing. And it's like, that's why most people, you end up buying more freeze dryers because you're like, I'm trying to keep up capacity. And, and especially for longer cycle items um, like fruit, meat, things like that, you know, you know, that freeze dryer is taken up for 24 to 48 hours, you know, and that that doesn't allow you to be able to do things like where candy where it's, you know, just a couple hours um, sure. and so, yeah, I completely understand that for sure. Assuming that there's a lot of humidity there and humidity plays a huge, Ooh. huge impact on how soon you have to take out the product, how you package it, you know, and, and that type of thing. How do you, how do you regulate the humidity and making sure, you know, it doesn't like a fruit doesn't become more soft again and not crunchy, things like that. That's a that's a great question because that was that was the very first thing that we had to overcome because the humidity here uh, year round. Right now we're in the dry season, and so you know it's not too rainy for about six months, but then for six months out of the year it's raining every single day. But even during the dry season, the humidity's you know eighty ninety percent every day. Um, vacuum seal bags and gamma lids <laughs> those are those are those are probably the first two things that we said okay look if, we, if we're going to make candy which candy is great because the turnover is extraordinary but it loses its pizzazz when the gummy worms are kind of gummy again right you know what i'm saying and so the first thing we do is we take them out of the freeze dryer pop them in a vacuum seal bag without vacuum obviously and then stick everything inside of a inside of a, a bin with a with one of those gamma lids and uh, and they hang tight there for for a while. And usually in those gamma lids, I put some sort of a portable dehydrator, like a, a dehumidifier, like one of those things. Uh, when it comes to food, food's tricky because you know you have to kind of go almost from from zero to hundred miles an hour as soon as the food comes out. So for us, we typically don't want to store a lot of food in gamma in buckets. And so within 
I would say within 10 to 15 minutes of the cycle being complete, we kind of get a team ready and we're like, okay, you're in charge of O2 absorbers. You're in charge of, of portioning the bag. You're in charge of sealing it. And everybody's hitting it one time. And we're trying to, we're trying to package it all up as quick as we can, because honestly, in this, in this climate within, within 30 minutes, if the freeze dried food is just on the table for 30 minutes, it's already starting to, to, to rehydrate on, on some level. And you don't want, you obviously you don't want that, you know? Yeah. And so yeah, it, it, it has been tricky. How did you calculate what the time frame was going to be like from, a, a, you know, it being in the freeze dryer to packaging? You know, we could approach that in, in two ways. Uh, when it came to regular food, stuff that is, is a regular batch, Let's say you're doing it at 125 Fahrenheit, and you're gonna and you're gonna run a regular cycle until it's finished. Um, that was kind of straightforward, and so there wasn't really a whole lot of um, experimenting when it came with that. And the, the, we realized very quickly because we did a batch of of sea bass in over here. The something called ceviche is super popular. And so we freeze dried like 20 pounds of ceviche and and had her on the counter and realized almost almost immediately that it started to, to rehydrate. And so we said, okay, we have to do it a little differently. Um, things like candy, the first thing that we realized, and this is really where experimentation came in, is that every single tutorial on the internet um, is subjective to the person's uh, conditions, their, their climate, their humidity. There are so many variations that, that kind of play as to how the candy comes out. And so, you know, initially you watch a YouTube video and you're like, okay, uh, gummy worms, let's do it at this temperature for this amount of time. And then, you know, mine expand to, to this big. And next thing you know, I'm having to clean out every single tray because it's, it's insane. And so that did take a little bit of experimenting. I, I did realize because we live in a, a warmer climate and hardly anybody has an air conditioner. Honestly, you kind of don't need it where we live because it's, it's a pretty nice temperature. But because it is a little warmer than most people's homes and it is a lot more humid, um, things tend to freeze dry slower and candy tends to expand a lot faster. And so that did take a lot of experimenting to really kind of dial it in. Um, but once you kind of go, okay, these are the conditions that I'm working with. Now you can adjust every recipe and, and you're good to go. Yeah. Prior to Harvest Strike coming out with the candy mode where you could warm the tray um, to, you know, 150 degrees, you know, I, I think what I did with most candies is if you left it out in more of that kind of regular temperature around your house or something like that, it would naturally soften. And so when I would do taffy or when I would do anything kind of gummy related, it would kind of soften it up and therefore it would expand larger than what I wanted it to be versus if I kept the high chews and I kept the different kind of more chewy base types of candies in a more controlled environment that was cooler. Then when I prepped it on the tray and I immediately put it in the freeze dryer, it, it, it kind of controlled the variable uh, expansion. And so it's nice that there's more people doing freeze drying because there's more information now and you don't sure. have as much waste, but it is kind of fun trying something. And then you're like, Oh shoot, you know, <laughs> it expanded way too much. And then you have to clean up the freeze dryer for sure. <sighs> Yeah, golly! I know there was there was a good there was a decent time where we had, you know, probably three weeks, four weeks of different candies uh, on our menu that were, you know, basically clearance, yeah. <laughs> you know, clearance sale kind of things where where they were they were still good, they were edible, they just weren't perfect, and and that's what we're looking for. We're looking to create that that perfect product that people are like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's a little trial and error right there. What's like regulations like in Panama and Central America compared to the U.S.? Is it more flexible in Panama? What's the advantages? Like what what are you seeing differently than your experience living in the U.S.? Right. So there's there's definitely uh, a, a lot more flexibility, I would say, not only in Panama, but in Latin America. And if, if anybody were to visit uh, a Latin American country, from Mexico on down, you're going to find that you have a lot of street vendors, right? You have a lot of businesses where out of their home, they're selling tortillas or they're selling empanadas or, or, or you know, uh, over here, there's a very popular uh, drink called doodle. It's, it's, it's 
the translation means hard, but it's like a, a strange, like icy fruit, fruit icy. And you'll see signs all along the road, with different, you know, kind of pointing to people's houses saying, Hey, you can buy these fruit ices here. And so there's the, the laws are, are, are definitely a lot more lenient, so to speak, uh, over here because the country does recognize, uh, the people's ability to, to earn a living and, and, and have independent businesses. And so they do have to register, you know, a, as a business. But as far as, you know, like the FDA, so to speak, over here would be like the health department. Uh, it's not nearly as, it's not nearly as restrictive. Uh, you know, you have to have um, health inspections. You have to have a, ro- a rodent a check, rodent inspections and things like that. Uh, but for the most part, um, and, and if you were to see some of the places, you would be like, oh, yeah, OK, clearly, you know, they're they're relaxed on some of these <laughs> issues. Right. Uh, and, and so it's it's not nearly as intense as it is. I was doing some reading online of, of what it was like to uh, uh, to have, a, let's say, a sausage business in the United States. And wow, I mean, it is pretty incredible. Yeah. So depending on what state you live in yeah. uh, and, and what kind of food you're handling, you know, the laws can the laws can vary and it can get kind of expensive. To, uh, to start up a little business. And so it's, I would say it would be the opposite of that in uh, not only where I live, but in Latin America, just because of the nature of the, of, of how the people go to market. It's, it, you know, it's, it's right. not a country where people make a lot of money. And so people find very ingenious ways to kind of have, have side businesses, uh, whether it's picking fruit from their backyard or slaughtering chickens or selling eggs or, or, Milk from a milk cow, you know, things like that. Or the health department, are they very curious of what freeze drying is in, in the country and in, in your town? I would say that it still isn't really on the radar. Like it's one of those things that it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's this is a scientific process, right? Rather than uh, a, a restaurant or food process is what it comes down to. I know that things get a little more strict when someone wants to take their, their, the product that they make out of their home or out of their facility and they want to put it into a store right so so the moment that interaction happens right so currently if i'm selling at a at a at a local farmers market that's that's one thing but if i want to take that product and put it into a grocery store like a like a you know a walmart or something like that and then all of a sudden like all the rules change and so now that's when that's when you start to see the the regulations become a little more strict as to um, expiration dates and, and things like that. And so whenever it comes to freeze dried food, I mean, if you can imagine, like, right. how do you, how do you figure that out? Uh, and so it, it is interesting. And I do think that they are going to start probably implementing, uh, you know, protocols for freeze dried businesses and freeze dried food. I just don't think, I, honestly, I'd be surprised if it happened in the next five years, honestly. I still think we're, we're every bit of five years away from that. If you're loving the discussion and dialogue that I'm having with Eric at Two Guys in a Cooler, give this video a thumbs up right now. It'll really help the YouTube algorithm to push this out to more people who need to know about freeze drying and be inspired about being an entrepreneur in the freeze drying space. Also, I've got video links below in the description of other interviews that I've had with other entrepreneurs in this space. Let's get back to the interview and find out more about Eric's freeze drying business. Well, let's talk about your products. So you bought a freeze dryer. You bought it. What reason? Why did you buy a freeze dryer? What has the evolution looked like? Uh, So uh, I guess it's twofold because for me, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. Like when I see, when I see something in my mind, I'm like, how can I turn that into a business? Right. And, and then there's the fact that I'm a content creator. So I also have a YouTube channel. So, so at the end of the day, when people started sort of buzzing around, you know, um, do you, is there anything that you have that, that doesn't require refrigeration? Uh, this country from time to time will have a pretty radical protests, not, not, not like anything you've ever seen. And I don't want to get into, you should look it up. It's pretty incredible. But when this country protests, uh, the entire country gets basically shut down for the standstill. The last protest we had lasted a little over five weeks, four to five weeks. Wow. And within that four to five week period, the, Beef, chicken, milk, uh, butter, eggs, all of that was gone. It, it wasn't on the shelf. Uh, certain parts of the country couldn't get any vegetables and gasoline was, wasn't available. Uh, you know, it, it was, it was pretty radical. People were having to cook on, on wood campfires. And I, 
when I say people, I'm not talking about one or two. I'm talking about thousands and thousands of people because there wasn't gas for stoves. And so this this radical event that happened uh, sort of jumps, you know, jump started this idea that, hey, you know, forget about long term storage. Let's talk about situations that happen where somebody doesn't have food and maybe they have kids and they need milk or they need meat or whatever. And uh, that was kind of like the beginning, like the genesis of it, so to speak. And then from there, I thought, you know, we could we could like there's so much opportunity. It doesn't have to only be freeze dried food. It could be like in my mind, it's almost limitless uh, from produce to, you know, to dog treats to fruit. We love dragon fruit. So we make a lot of different fruit powders. And and then, of course, the entrepreneurial side of me said, well, I can make YouTube content with all this as well. And at the end of the day, if the freeze dry business doesn't work, at least I'll have YouTube content that maybe somebody will find helpful. Uh, come to find out, it's it's kind of worked both ways, and so it was it was quite extraordinary how that happened. Like, how many times has that has a protest happened? Is it happening yearly? Does it happen every other year uh, due to more political types of voting periods? Really, America has only faced that. Really, the pandemic was like this sure. huge episode of we are out of baby formula, we are out of infant Tylenol, we are out of meat and all these different things that 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 really i think boosted all the freeze drying types of uh industry sure. you know for most people to to realize that they need to at least have something packaged so yeah what how often does that happen in panama okay so we've been here for uh, 15 years and i honestly it's really only ha- at that at that level it's only happened i would say maybe four times um it happened this year. It happened last year. And then in the past 13 years, it's only happened two other times. Uh, and, and it really just comes down to situations, uh, politics, and, and how the people are feeling about whatever's going on. And the, the people have an extraordinary voice in this country. It's, yeah. it's actually pretty remarkable to see. Uh, in, my, in my opinion, it's kind of like true democracy. But, um, but when the people aren't happy, they are absolutely uh, ready to, to make their voice known and, and the government hears it, which is kind of (laughs) cool, but, but yeah, so to answer your question, it's only happened about four times, but when you start to look at other Latin American countries, when you look at Colombia, Venezuela, when you look at Ecuador and Honduras and Guatemala, you start to see Chile, you start to see situations like this where, you know, people are not happy and, and it's not necessarily related to, to a global pandemic. It's just related to economic necessity and um, it causes a disruption in in the food chain. It causes a disruption in in economics, and you know, I guess that's the point of a protest. But on on our end, we look at that and we say, how can we be prepared, you know, for the next one? Not for the 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 twenty five years from now apocalypse or whatever, but the protests that might happen in six or eight months or in a year. Or well, four. I mean, four protests in fifteen years. I mean, that's. That's I I feel like that's at least frequent enough to where you really do have to prepare yourself for every four or five years something like that happening in those sure. types of uh, developed countries. Um, my other uh, question to that was: Does it take even a long? Does it take still a long period of time after the unrest is there for everything to get back to normal as well? I, I did. I did wonder, like, so, so, you know, we went through this, this thing and this last one was, was, uh, this last one was a tough one. I got to be completely honest. I think everybody felt like it was a tough one. I bet the sale of electronic stoves skyrocketed after this last protest, because it, most everybody here uses, uses gas. And, um, and, and my wife and I were talking about, Hey, what's the recovery time going to be after it's all said and done. But, uh, surprisingly it was actually very quickly i want to say within seven to ten days uh the country was you you would have never known um people were still on edge but the grocery stores were fully stocked the uh, gas stations were loaded down people had gas and so it, it actually recovered very very quickly and then people were you know going about their business which is kind of nice to see what products are you actually freeze drying and selling to the public right so the it, it freeze drying dog food originally began with our dogs right so we feed them a raw diet we wanted to keep the dogs as as you know as, as organic and raw as we possibly could so 100 percent 
you know, grass fed beef, no hormones, all that really great stuff. And, um, we love giving our dogs treats. Uh, we have two beautiful Connie Corsos. They're absolutely amazing. And so we started to, you know, kind of create freeze dried dog treats, whether it was chicken necks, organ meat, uh, chicken bites, or, or even just our own collection of like bananas with all, all kinds of like little, little kibbles. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's originally how it started. And, and honestly, although I knew the opportunity existed, you know, it's a funny thing when you have one freeze dryer, you got to go, okay, how do I divide the time up where I can still meet the demand for the candy, where I can meet the demand for the freeze dried long-term storage, you know, where you, you, you kind of have to sort of split up the time for the freeze dryer. And it wasn't until we got a second freeze dryer. And so we just got not too long ago, the, the new pro version of the Harvest Right freeze dryers, which I absolutely love the, the extra space and it's amazing. And, um, and with that, it kind of freed up some time and allowed us to do, to do double the production sort of like in, in what we were doing. And, um, and that's when people started asking, Hey, when are you going to, you know, cause people check out our Instagram and they, they see pictures of, of different dog trees that we have on Instagram. They're like, Hey, when, when, when is that going to be available? A lot of pets, a lot of beautiful pet owners in this, in this little village. And, um, and so that's when the opportunity became, it, it sort of, it sort of is like, Hey, People are asking, if you don't do it, someone else is going to do it. Yeah, it's kind of like one of those things. And so we're a family-run business. I've got my two youngest are uh, growing up, and they're getting into a place where you know they could take on some more responsibility in the family business. And in my mind, I thought, hey, you know what? This is a great opportunity to teach them about entrepreneurship, teach them about sourcing ingredients and pricing and labeling and, and packaging, which is kind of complicated. We can talk about that later if you want. Um, and then kind of let, let them handle that arm of, of, cause I'm, I'm max you know, when it comes to, to responsibility, I'm up here. And so, uh, you know, say, Hey, let me delegate some of this responsibility to them, let them take ownership and, uh, and have a lot of fun with it. And so that arm of the business includes uh, freeze dried and, and dehydrated depending on, on, on what it is. But the, but the freeze dried version of it, I like, because, you know, as you know, Freeze drying food retains 80, 85 percent of the of the original nutrients. And you know, if you want to give something like that to your dog, you want them to have the absolute best, the absolute most that they can get out of it. And so for us, that's super important. And I think it's such a, a niche that offering freeze dried dog treats uh, to the community is is kind of like, hey, nobody else is doing that. Obviously, yeah. you could find dehydrated dog treats all day long. Uh, but freeze dried dog treats are different, so we kind of bundle everything together, and it kind of works out. What is different that you're finding about freeze drying dog treats um, that makes it different from dehydrated as well as dried dog food? So the the dehydrated market uh, where we live is extremely expensive. It's 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 super super expensive, and so a, a small bag. Now this this may seem par for the course in other countries, but a small bag of I, I'm going to give you an example two. Two dehydrated chicken feet, okay. Two dehydrated chicken feet at the local pet store sell for about a, about two dollars, okay. So I, I I'm kind of out of touch with with pricing in other countries, but to me that seems extremely expensive. Like it's through the roof expensive, and so we're noticing this this sort of concern that people have. They're like, yeah, I want to get my dog dog treats, but it's it's the price is just out of control. And so our vision was, hey, let's let's bring dehydrated, which is, as you know, you know, basically cooked it at, I wouldn't say low temperatures, but not hot temperatures, 140, 150 degrees until until it's dried and crunchy. Uh, but you do lose a lot of the, the nutrients. And so I think where dehydrated treats shine is their texture and what they do to stimulate the dog, you know, gum you know, for, for, for gum health and for uh, emotional wellness and things like that. The other end of the spectrum, the spectrum that I like to entertain uh, is the, is the freeze dried version where you have, you know, your fish, your, your chicken, your liver, your chicken necks, whatever, whatever you're going to be dehydrating, or if you're going to be making your own kibble um, with this much higher retained nutritional value. Uh, what I've found to be probably the most tricky part is, is, finding a place where people feel like they're getting a good price 
or uh, basically a good value is what it comes down to. And so that's been probably the most tricky part about that sidearm. But people do tend to gravitate towards, hey, my dog is getting older, you know, they're not eating their vegetables or whatever, and they're looking for ways to put uh, the nutrients into the dog food. And, and we offer, you know, different toppings and powdered vegetables that can be mixed in with the meat and things like that, where you're getting all those beautiful nutrients um, and, and the dog the dog doesn't know it. Because we're extracting the water from, let's say, some liver, things like that, right? Like, do you have to somewhat put some water back in to that liver that you're going to give to the dog and, and reconstitute it a little bit? Um, or Like, would they become super thirsty after eating freeze-dried food um, with the dog? That's a great question. Yeah. Great question. Let me, let me ask, when, when was the last time you had a freeze-dried ice cream? Uh, yesterday. Yesterday. But, I love freeze-dried ice cream. <laughs> it's the first thing that I made when I got my freeze dryer was yes. freeze dried ice cream. It was awesome. absolutely amazing. And immediately after you eating that freeze dried ice cream, did you feel like you were you were parched and you needed to go get some water? Not not as much as it was after you finished like regular ice cream. Sometimes you need the water. Yeah, exactly. And so what what we typically tell people is that if you're going to be feeding your dog an entire meal that's been freeze dried, right? So let's say you have freeze dried kibble or you have whatever it is that's going to be freeze dried, you're going to want to rehydrate it. Absolutely no question about it. And we typically suggest adding something like a kefir or a yogurt or something like that to to that freeze dried product to help re rehydrate it with like, you know, probiotics. But if you're just giving your dog a snack, yeah. Um, if, you're if you're responsible with the snack, then there's literally nothing to worry about. The dog... Yeah. Uh, or the cat, actually, in some circumstances, um, aren't gonna aren't gonna feel like they need to go and get some water immediately. And if they do, then generally their water bowl is pretty handy. But it's usually not. What's, what's available in Panama that maybe not even it doesn't have to be fruit, but maybe the candy and things like that. What what are those things called, and what have you been freeze drying that's fun? The candy scene in Panama absolutely is is horrible. This is this is not a country where you go to get candy, uh, and so uh, strangely enough, when we do offer different candies that are freeze dried, I almost always have to import it from the United States. So it's not like I can't get Skittles or anything like that, but but the good majority of like some of the candies that you see, the popular candies, um, very difficult to get in this country. What this country does offer that's absolutely amazing, and in my opinion a million times better than freeze dried candy is, is fruit. Their fruit is unbelievable. They have a beautiful fruit called the uh, mangosteen. It's a, a fruit that was made illegal in the United States for, for quite some time. And I think it's legal now, but it's a extraordinary super fruit. Dragon fruit is really big. It's sort of, it's one of those crops here in this country that just recently became, you know, a farmable, like a farmable crop. So the government recognized dragon fruit as, as a, a commercial crop. And, and now you start to see a lot of people commercially producing dragon fruit. So we get our, we have an orchard in our backyard with, you know, 400 plants. Yeah. We do a lot of freeze dried, a lot of freeze dried dragon fruit, which is absolutely amazing uh, in my opinion. And so we do, we do a little series on our YouTube channel where we do like freeze dried fruit experiments where I, where I determined where, you know, if it's better freeze dried or if it's better fresh. And a lot of the fruits, especially things like mango, papaya, pineapple, like you had mentioned, banana, soursop are absolutely out of this world freeze dried. It's like the flavor is just magnified. I mean, you know, it's just pops in your mouth. And so I love doing fruits. People love the assortment freeze dried fruit packets that we do have because we try to do, especially when I'm making videos, you know, we have all these different fruits that we're doing and it will add, you know, uh, grapes and blueberries and, and cherries and all kinds of really crazy freeze dried things into into a bag and people have never had it before and so it's kind of like one of those things where it's this first reaction of, of something amazing and they're just like where can we get more yeah so it's pretty awesome is, is fruit fairly inexpensive to to uh one not only purchase but also farm so that you like the cost the cost for you as a as a business owner to then freeze dry at least the cost on the product is not super high or what's, what's it like there? I would say for the most part, fruit is fairly inexpensive. Bananas run seven for a dollar. Um, pineapples are 75 cents each or a dollar each. It, it, it varies depending on where you live in, in the United States, but around here, those are all super common fruits. Papaya, same thing, super cheap. Dragon fruit on the other hand is super expensive. 
which doesn't make any sense to me. It's almost it's almost like it's been priced outside of the reach of a of a typical Panamanian because they're charging five to six dollars a pound, which is just unheard of for a fruit in this country. That's there's no other fruit that's priced like that. That's like USA prices or or Canada prices or something like that for for yeah. dragon fruit. And so that's one of the reasons we started growing dragon fruit because it was just like I love the fruit. I wish more Panamanians would would taste it so that they could grow it as well. And so we started this dragon fruit orchard business for that purpose. But each year we end up with 250, 300, 400 pounds of dragon fruit that it just becomes overwhelming. So yeah, we do have to freeze dry and and then we have it, you know, to make desserts with and smoothies and ice cream and cheesecake and things like that, that then we'll turn around and put it on our, on our make available for people to taste and and have and buy and things like that. Awesome. So it's always, it's always this kind of like this, this very organic, everything sort of, sort of interacts with each other. Um, type of entrepreneurship where everything we do has some sort of an effect on something else. It's kind of cool, actually. So are you, so are you recommending that I experiment with, with uh, dragon fruit, see kind of what, how it is uh, and things like that? Oh my gosh. Freeze, freeze dried dragon fruit. Freeze dried dragon fruit's amazing in, in cubes, in slices. The problem, and I'll tell you what the problem is, is, is how quickly it, uh, it it does want to now. Granted, I live in a super humid environment. You 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 may not experience this, but I'll tell you the first time someone tries a dragon fruit, especially if it's not like the you know there's some dragon fruit that are kind of bland, right? So that the most the most uh, unfortunate experience that people have with dragon fruit is eating that one beautiful dragon fruit that's kind of like your stereotypical red flesh white you know, white flesh, red, red skin, dragon fruit. It looks amazing, but it has no flavor. Yes. Most people's experience with it. If you can get varieties outside of that, that are acidic and sweet and, and, and have all these complexities with berries and coconuts and, and things like that, freeze drying, those fruits are, are kind of life-changing. <laughs> I'll tell you so, what. Wait, so you're saying combine different elements with the, the dragon fruit, or are you saying to freeze dry the dragon fruit there are dragon fruit varieties that embody okay. citrus flavors and berry flavors and coconut and and almost rose like flavors and, and so it just okay. depends on the variety there's there's you know in our in our orchard we probably have 160 different varieties and each one of them has its own kind of unique oh, cool. thing going on some are sweet some are tart some are you know beet flavored but you can speaking of which if you're going to freeze dry you can kind of like marinate uh, your fruit with things like basil or uh, citrus, like an orange or a lime or something like that to kind of give it other characteristics and then freeze dry it. And now you create your own complexity. Uh, That's kind of like your own version of fruit, which is kind of interesting. I just want to ask you about your freeze dryer and you have a harvest, right? But did you find it difficult to get shipped internationally? Did you look at other freeze dryers um who is there is it uh difficult yeah to to import a freeze dryer from u.s companies are there other companies around other uh you know countries that uh are are making these that you contacted so great question by the way so the the, it all comes down to where you live and, and what's available to you here in this country uh, there are shipping outfits that kind of use freight forwarding companies that are either located in Miami or or whatever, where if I wanted to have something shipped to me from the United States, it would just get shipped to Miami or or wherever my freight forwarder is, and uh, they would take care of shipping it to, to where I live. And usually that process takes, depending on, on the company, it could take anywhere from seven to 10 days. It, it really doesn't, you know, wow. the, the issue is is the weight, <laughs> how heavy it is, right? And a lot of companies will charge by weight. So, you know, a, a typical freeze dryer when it ships from Harvest Right, if it's the large variety, it may it may weigh three hundred and yeah. fifty pounds, something like that. And if a company's charging three bucks a pound, where well, you're out, you know, that's a thousand bucks in in shipping. Uh, the trick I found is to find a company that charges by volume. <laughs> and and there's a lot of companies here that are great companies. They're responsible. They're respectable. And they do they do charge by volume, uh, which uh, ends up costing about 450, 500 bucks to ship a freeze dryer down here. But I, I found that it was pretty much across the board consistent with most companies. Um, the companies that did ship to 
to not only where I live, but other Latin American countries, they were, they were commercial units. So they're like, yeah, we'll ship it to you, but we're talking, you know, a $150,000 unit, something like that when it comes to freeze drying. Yeah. And so as far as, as far as the residential units that are, that are large enough to kind of start a business, um, you know, you've got, obviously you've got harvest, right. And, and they made it pretty easy to, to ship it out. And, and I want to say that from the moment the order was placed to when I got it, I, I think a total of two and a half, three weeks had passed. Uh, but it, you know, it depends on availability, depends on holidays, things like that. Yeah. I, I do know that the popularity of freeze dryers is skyrocketing. And so these companies, not only harvest, right, but other competitors are, um, uh, are, are having a day keeping up with the demand. It, it seems like it's very much U.S. based, but man, as soon as the world is starting to sure. uh, ex experience this, I think it could be another huge boom. Um, One thing I did find, I I did find like, you know, if, if you want to get into, at least for me, and, and you live in a place where it's, it's still a relatively unknown uh, business, uh, packaging. Packaging is extremely complicated when it comes to to how do we how do we get the right things that we need and so a hundred percent of the packaging that is dedicated for long-term storage has to be imported because it's just it's just not available mylar bags and, and any of that stuff uh they have they have what are those those kind of the bags that you use i can't recall the name they're called uh, oh, uh, the artisan bags yeah the, the, they're just like a craft a craft, craft bag, bags. food food dry bags. Yeah. I'm looking. I'm looking at a pile of them right there. Those are great, and those are fairly inexpensive, and those work well for products that don't necessarily um, require like humid protection, you humidity right. protection. And yeah. so, you know, we absolutely. Or if we use those, we're putting our freeze dry products in like a, a small vacuum seal bag first, and then they're going in that bag just to kind of save on, on the price of packaging. But that's another big thing that we had to consider, like oxygen absorbers, desiccants, and mylar bags. And, and you know, how many do we bring in at a time? What's the cost to bring them in? And how do you price that accordingly so that, uh, so that it's, you know, it's fair and, and reasonable for everybody involved, I think. Yeah. That's a tricky part. <laughs> yeah. The big elephant in the room for most people looking into freeze drying is, have you found that, freeze drying and then selling it is profitable. Absolutely. There's no question about it. I, I think, and, and here's kind of the unpopular perspective at the end of the day. Like I, I don't think um, it's too late to get into the freeze drying game. I don't think it's too late to get into the candy freeze drying game. I think there's a huge opportunity. I think the biggest problem that people are going to have is how they manage their business, right? At the end of the day, you can have the machine, which does a great job. It's kind of, you know, does its own thing. You can have a product, which is awesome, not a problem. But how you take all of that and go to market is really what's going to be the difference between a successful freeze dry business and one that unfortunately has a, a used freeze dryer on the on the Facebook business page. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. for sale. So I think that understanding, hey, if I get a freeze dryer and I want to have a business, I think that people need to have a plan before they even pull the trigger. What's my marketing strategy? How do I want to like what where, what's my audience look like? What's my pricing going to look like? Is there is there opportunity in the town that I live in, and what are the laws applicable? I think I think that before people you know because people can get pretty excited pretty quickly, make that decision, yeah. and then try to fill in the blanks later, and and that's a little more complicated. And don't get me wrong, I don't think there's any problem with having a free dryer, but if you're going to spend hard earned money like we did and 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 your savings to say hey this is a great business to kind of get me out of the rat race uh, which i totally get like it is it's a, it's a great business it's very profitable uh when done properly there's a huge demand for it and and as i talked about in this video there's lots of different options uh, depending on on how hard you're willing to work is what it comes down to i think people just need to kind of take a step back and say let's either talk with other business owners or let's put something down on paper just to kind of see what it looks like and um, and maybe attend some of these markets that I'm supposedly going to be selling at and see what that looks like, yes. you know, and, and, um, and then, and even with that, at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of blood, sweat and tears owning a business, uh, a lot of work. And, and you know, it's an interesting thing because most people, um, 
get hung up on the risks, you know, because owning a business, there's always risks involved. You know, you have a machine. What if it doesn't work? What if nobody buys my product? What happens? You know, like there's all these there's all these questions. And I think at the end of the day, every single successful business owner, no matter if they're a small business or a Fortune 500, um, they accept the risks. They come to terms with the risks and they overcome them at the end of the day. You know, so all, what, what I find is that successful people, uh, especially in business, are problem solvers, right? They, they have an issue that pops up and then they move past it. And, and problems certainly come up. There's no question about it when you're dealing with freeze drying, whether it's, you know, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where your freeze dryer all of a sudden, you know, stopped working. But there are some business owners where they have a harvest and they're going to take their harvest to market. And all of a sudden, for whatever reason, the free shower stopped working and um, and they have to overcome those issues. And and so being able to do that in, uh, in a, you know, a positive and, and encouraging way to be able to, to kind of move forward, I think, is absolutely critical uh, yeah. when it comes to owning a business. And you're either going <laughs> to learn to fix it yourself or have to make enough money to have someone fix it for you exactly um exactly yeah, and that's another things. thing i would say like if if you want to get into the freeze dry game and you're gonna get a freeze dryer i don't necessarily think it's super imperative to be like hey i need to become a freeze dry mechanic but i think it's kind of important for you to know uh, for someone who's getting into that for you to know like, at least the basics of how a freeze dryer works right what are the components what do they do so that way if something were to happen Maybe troubleshooting it might be a little bit easier and a lot less, yeah. you know, cost prohibitive. If if you could say, "Hey, I, I think this is kind of where the issue is coming from," and don't get me wrong, it that does take a little bit of experience and it does take a couple problems to get to that place. But yeah. I think that is super important where people go, "Hey, I have an issue. What can I do uh, relatively inexpensively to take care of it myself?" And um, funny enough, as as complex as freeze drying is, it's actually a fairly. Would you agree? It's a fairly simple machine. Yeah. Uh, in, in the operation, uh, the complexity comes from the, the little computer program, but the way the machine works, it's actually pretty simple, in my opinion. Thank you so much, Eric, for give, being very open about your business and, and your life sure. in Panama. And, and thank you for all the advice that you're giving all of us on being an entrepreneur in the freeze drying space. If you've made it to me right now, thank you for watching the entire video of the interview I had with Eric. If you're interested in freeze drying and interested to know more about who's out there doing freeze drying as a business, I'd encourage you to take a look at the next video that I'm gonna show where I interview both Parker Freeze Dryer who makes industrial freeze dryers as well as Josh over at Sweet Potato Awesome in Las Vegas, Nevada. These are great interviews and I think you're really gonna like the content. We'll see you over there.